In my last lecture, I confused you by skipping around between mosques. Today, I'm going to try to stick with a somewhat more coherent chronology and geography, and instead confuse you by mixing up different kinds of works. Islamic art includes many universal elements, but it has also changed over time and developed important regional variations, often reflecting earlier art traditions from the same geographical reason, region. So let's dash through a little history. In my first lecture, I talked about the life of Muhammad, his immediate successors, the four caliphs, and the establishment of an Umayyad caliphate headquartered in Damascus. An Umayyad caliph ordered construction of the Dome of the Rock, completed in 691. The Umayyads, however, lost out to the Abbasids in 750 CE, but a branch of the family fled to North Africa and on to Spain, where it established its capital at Cordoba. So here's a map of the Umayyad Empire at its height before its downfall in 750, and here's a map of the Abbasid Caliphate that succeeded the Umayyads. Note again that the Umayyad dynasty lived on in Spain. We're going to return to Al-Andalus, or Muslim Spain, in a moment. But first, let's pause and talk about Islam as a religion of the book. For this, we will look at an Abbasid work from North Africa, or the Near East. This required work was produced on parchment, or processed animal skin. The Quran was one of Islam's great unifying forces, virtually always printed in Arabic. It created a common language and literature across the Islamic world. The reverence for the word elevated the art of calligraphy, the beautiful hand. Calligraphers underwent years of training, and the best became famous. Most early Islamic texts were written in the Kufic script you see here. Its bold, angular, and even lines were easy to read, even at a distance. Arabic, like Hebrew, is read from right to left, and its written form does not contain vowels, only consonants. The red symbols you see here, circled in purple, add in vowels to make reading aloud easier. The five gold balls, circled here in green, mark the end of a verse of the surah or chapter of the Quran. The surah's title is written in gold ink and surrounded by a rectangle decorated with entwined vines. And you remember the word for that? It's an arabesque. Note that the words are beautifully spaced on the page. Your reading assignment explained how calligraphers used interlines to space the letters properly. Now on to Al-Andalus, or Muslim Spain. Well, if I were offered a trip in a time machine and told that I had to go back to the year 1000, but I could go anywhere in that year, I'm pretty sure I'd dial up Cordoba. It was a city of vast learning, exquisite architecture and art, and a cosmopolitan, tolerant environment where Muslims, Jews, and Christians lived in relative harmony and with considerable intellectual and cultural exchange. We've already examined the Mosque of Cordoba. Now let's watch a video clip that talks about the Islamic culture of Muslim Spain and then takes you on a tour of the Alhambra. To my mind, the most beautiful building I've ever visited. Of course, I've never been to India or seen the Taj Mahal. All of these are required college board images. The Alhambra was both a collection of palaces and a military barracks and fortress. Although a fortress was first constructed on this site in the 9th century, the Alhambra was rebuilt in the mid-13th century by the Nazarid emirs of Granada, who succeeded the Umayyads. By then, the Christians had reconquered most of Spain, including Cordoba, and the Emirate of Granada was the last Muslim outpost in Spain. As you can see from the plan, the palace buildings are generally quadrangular, with all the rooms opening onto a central court. Succeeding rulers added new quadrangles, designed on the same principle, and connected with each other by smaller rooms and passages. The unifying theme was paradise on earth, with columned arcades, fountains with running water, and reflecting pools that created an oasis effect. The exterior was left plain and austere, disguising the beauty that lay within. We'll see a somewhat similar layout when we get to the Taj Mahal, also a vision of paradise. Moorish poets describe the Alhambra as a pearl set in emeralds. Makes sense to me. The Alhambra represents one of the peaks of Islamic decorative arts. Elaborate filigrees were carved into stone and stucco. And here's the famous stalactite dome. These hanging decorative features were created out of plaster, not stone. These tiles from the Alhambra reveal what two characteristic elements of Islamic art? We see the use of calligraphy as a decorative element and tessellations, or repeated geometric patterns. 
Before I reluctantly leave Al Andalus, let me talk about the last of our required works from this region. A Pyxis is a cylindrical container that held aromatic spices, cosmetics, or even jewelry. This Pyxis was the gift to a son of the Caliph, perhaps in honor of his 18th birthday. It was carved from ivory from an elephant's tusk, a beautiful, durable, but easily carved material that was very popular in both Islamic and Byzantine culture. On the right, you see the largest surviving Byzantine ivory panel from the 6th century. Note the calligraphy just below the lid. It reads, Blessings from God, goodwill, happiness, and prosperity to Al-Mugira, son of the commander of the faithful. May God's mercy be upon you. So what are we seeing in this central medallion, and what might it mean? We see a lute player flanked by two figures, one of whom holds a braided scepter and flask of the Umayyads, while the other holds a fan. <coughs> Excuse me. The Khan Academy essay explained that the man with the fan might represent the Abbasids, who ruled in faraway Baghdad and had, of course, defeated the Umayyads of Damascus. So this work may be sending the message that the Umayyads, and not the Abbasids, are the legitimate rulers. Here are two more panels from the Pyxis. So what do you think? What's the likely significance of a lion attacking two bulls? Well, lions tend to represent kingly power, and this may be glorifying the king, but it also may be another reference to Umayyads fighting Abbasids, conveniently ignoring that it was the Abbasids who won. The men on horseback picking dates may also, according to art historians, refer to the lands lost to the Umayyads in the east. So, why all these human and animal figures on an Islamic work? Well, even though the inscription mentions Allah, this is not a religious work, so the prohibition doesn't apply. What do you think? What might interest the College Board about this work? Why did they pick this one? Well, there's that theme of power and authority. Go Umayyads. There's the reminder that the rule about aniconic images does not apply to non-religious works. There's the influence of Byzantine art on Islamic art, and maybe they just like, like this work. I do. So I debated where to put the Golden Haggadah, into which unit that is, and chose to talk about this Jewish manuscript here. It's a debatable choice, since we'll be comparing these pages with Gothic illuminated manuscripts that they closely resemble when we get to Christian art. In fact, here's a little foretaste. The required French Gothic illuminated manuscript in the upper left shows a king and queen of France. The illustration from the Golden Haggadah on the bottom right shows Moses and Aaron coming before the Pharaoh, who looks a lot like a French king. Some art historians think that the wealthy Jewish family that commissioned the Haggadah may even have hired Christian Gothic artists to produce it. But I decided to talk about the work here because medieval Spain was a golden age for Jewish learning and culture. Many Muslim rulers employed Jews as administrators, physicians, and scholars. Although the Muslims conquered Barcelona in 720, their rule lasted less than a century. Charlemagne's son reconquered it for the Christians in 801. In the succeeding years, Jews made up as much as 15% of the population of Barcelona, and many of these Jews became wealthy. They also made up a disproportionate percentage of the learned. In 1492, after their final victory over the Emir of Granada, King Ferdinand and Isabella celebrated the unification of Christian Spain by sending Columbus west and by expelling the Jews. So this work was made just decades before a disaster struck this community. A Haggadah is a kind of storybook used during Passover. Why could it contain human images, something that was as strongly prohibited in Judaism as in Islam? Well, as the assigned essay explained, there was a Haggadah loophole. The Haggadah was considered educational rather than religious. Hmm. Anyway, here you see the plagues descending on Egypt when the pharaoh refuses to let the Jews leave. The blown-up panel on the right shows a plague of lice. The other panels show the plague of frogs, disease, and wild animals. Here we see Jews escaping from Egypt. Starting on the upper left, the pharaoh orders the Jews to leave Egypt. The firstborn sons start to die after the pharaoh changes his mind. The Israelites cross the separated Red Sea. And finally, uh, this is the section I enlarged since I liked it best, the Red Sea returns and drowns the pursuing Egyptians. On this page, we see the household preparing for Passover dinner or Seder. Clockwise from the upper right, Miriam, Moses' sister, joins maidens in dancing and playing instruments. The family cleans the house for Passover. The master of the house, sitting under a canopy, orders the distribution of matzah or unleavened bread and 
Haroset, a sweet made from nuts and fruit, to the children, and sheep are slaughtered for Passover while a man purifies utensils in a cauldron over the fire. In the panel I enlarge, which shows the home being prepared for Passover, the man holding a candle searches for leavened bread and the woman and girl clean. In Jewish tradition, all traces of leavened bread, even the smallest crumb, must be removed from the home before sunset on the first day of Passover. Before we move east again to look at the Islamic art of the Mamluks, Ottomans, Persians, and Mughals, let's drop south for a moment and revisit Jenne. This map shows the spread of Islam into Africa starting about 750 CE. Historians aren't entirely sure when the first mosque on this site was built, as early as 1200, as late as 1330. The earliest written record we have of the mosque states that a Sultan Kunburu became a Muslim and had his palace pulled down and the site turned into a mosque. The original mosque presided over one of the most important Islamic learning centers in Africa during the Middle Ages, where thousands of students came to study the Quran in Jenne's madrasas or schools. Eventually, the site was abandoned and fell into decay. At the bottom, you see a French journalist drawing of the mosque in 1895. In 1906, the French administration in the town arranged for the original mosque to be rebuilt. Since then, it has been substantially remodeled. The three towers and the Qibla wall were added at this time. Art historians still debate just how much the design reflects the taste of the French administrators as opposed to the beliefs and preferences of the Muslim leaders of Jenne. Remember, the College Board wants you to know about competing interpretations. The overall design reflects a neo-Sudanese style that was being promoted at the time of the French, who wanted to give a uniform look to all their West African properties. But let's return to our Islamic art and architecture video for an excellent visual introduction to this mosque, and you'll see that our commentator weighs in on the debate about just how African the design really is. He thinks it's genuinely African. So as you just saw, the walls of the Great Mosque are made of sun-baked earth bricks and sand and earth-based mortar, and are coated with plaster, which gives the building its smooth, sculpted look. The mosque is built on a platform that is raised almost 10 feet above the level of the surrounding marketplace, shown here. These are the two College Board required images. The platform prevents damage to the mosque when the Bani River floods. The cone-shaped spires, or pinnacles at the top of each minaret, are topped with ostrich eggs, a traditional symbol of purity and fertility, and by traditional I mean pre-Islamic. The walls of the building are decorated with bundles of palm sticks, called toron, that project from the surface, and these also serve as scaffolding for replastering the mosque. So let's play our guessing again game again. What point is the College Board making with the second required image on the lower right? Well, Islam is very much a communal religion. The mosque is the center of the community's interaction. It houses a school and a market has grown up around it. This is an image that the College Board didn't require, but I think it should have, because this is what I find most fascinating about this mosque. Jenne is located on a river plain, and while the weather is generally dry, it experiences monsoon rains, so every spring it must be replastered. The entire community of Jenne comes together at this annual festival, the Crepissage. Music, dance, and some serious eating is apparently involved. And now, finally, we begin moving back east toward where our story of Islam began. The invasion of European crusaders, not a high point in the history of Christendom, increased the fragmentation of Islamic civilization, as would the invasion of Mongols from the east. One consequence, to oversimplify some very complicated history, was the rise of the Mamluk Empire. The Mamluks were a group of warrior slaves, mostly Turks, who took control of several Muslim states and established a dynasty that ruled Egypt and Syria from 1250 until the Ottoman conquest in 1517. The Mamluks were not, the, were not only first-rate warriors, they were first-rate craftsmen as well, renowned across the medieval world for their glass, textiles, and metalwork. Master metal craftsman Muhammad ibn al-Zayn created this brass basin in the early 14th century. The story it tells is all about the power, wealth, and authority of Mamluk rulers. The basin's wide central outer band depicts processions of Mamluk emirs or officials. Four horsemen in roundels punctuate the procession of dignitaries. They may be personifications of different aspects of Ferusia, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, or the Muslim art of horsemanship. Friezes of animals and coats of arm frame the exterior band and decorate the basin's interior as well. 
The basin is an example of an object produced for one ceremonial context, but later repurposed for another. My guess is that's why it made the college board cut. Change over time. The basin was probably commissioned banqueting piece, all alternately a vessel for ceremonial hand washing. Eventually, however, it ended up in France, where the basin was used for at least the 17th century to baptize children born to the French royal family, including Louis XIII. The various coats of arms on the basin may have been worked over later with fleur de lis. On the other hand, it's a motif with appeal both to the basin's original Islamic and to its later European owners. The flower was a popular Mamluk symbol in the 13th and 14th century, but it was also a heraldic device of the French royal family. Here are a few images from the basin, including the artist's signature, which appears six times. Like our Khan Academy scholars, I especially like the fellow walking a leopard. Okay, whew, I'm going to finish up today with the Muslim empire that ended the Christian Byzantine Empire, turning its capital of Constantinople into Muslim Istanbul. So let's watch a brief video introduction to this fascinating empire, which ruled much of Eastern Europe and the Middle East into the 20th century. And then I'm going to return to the one Ottoman work we will study, or rather revisit, the Mosque of Selim II at Edirne. Well, I'm actually skipping over an exciting part of the story, the conquest of Constantinople by the Ottomans in 1453, the first major use of gunpowder in warfare. Instead, I'm moving right into the time of Suleiman the Magnificent, who ruled from 1520 to 1566. Suleiman was one of the most accomplished and fascinating rulers in world history, and I'm mostly going to ignore him and focus instead on his chief architect, Sinan. The next video clip does not show our required work, the Great Mosque at Adirne, but rather the main mosque that Sinan built for Suleiman in Istanbul, shown here on the left, next to our required mosque of Adirne. And yes, this is an artist who might invite an attribution question. Sinan lived to be 98, and he built over 90 large mosques, 50 smaller mosques, 57 colleges, 8 bridges, and numerous other public buildings throughout the Ottoman realm. Lots of buildings for the College Board to choose from. Selim II was Suleiman's son. He wasn't much of a ruler. He's mostly known for his spectacularly extravagant orgies. But he did have the good sense to employ Daddy's architect. Sanan himself considered this mosque his masterpiece, and that's saying a lot. So what identifies this mosque as the work of Sinan and as an Ottoman mosque, a style, by the way, that would be admired and copied throughout the Islamic world? Well, some of the elements I would list would be the tall, pencil-thin minarets, a wide open space where the mirab can be seen from every corner of the mosque, and above all, the soaring dome surrounded by smaller half domes or apses. Here's the plan of the mosque. This is the College Board required image, but with labels. Sorry, it's a little blurry. I couldn't find a clearer image. Note that the worship hall is surrounded by outbuildings, a madrasa or school, a cemetery, a dormitory for students, and a covered colonnaded market. The complex also included a hospital and a soup kitchen. The mosque itself is an octagonal with a dome contained within a rectangle that has four iwans or rectangular recessed openings into the corridor. We saw rounded iwans at Isfahan, and we'll see them again in my final lecture. Note also the large courtyard with the fountain for ritual washing. This is an entire religious community, the center of communal life, as well as religious ritual in the city. Here's a more panoramic view of the huge prayer hall, which shows the half dome surrounded by the central dome. The area beneath the half domes are called excedre, semicircular recesses. We'll see those again when we get to Byzantine art. And here's the dome itself. Note the striped voussoirs and the tessellated designs in the mosaics. And what else echoes the mosque at Cordoba? Double arches. I'm going to close with a building that dates from a millennium earlier and a building that we will study in depth in a future unit. When the Ottomans conquered Constantinople, they turned the world's largest building into a mosque. That's when the minarets were built. In looking at Sinan's work, it's very important to understand that much of what motivated him was a desire to imitate, to equal, and finally to surpass the accomplishments of Byzantine architects. Again, stay tuned. In my final Islamic art lectures, I will move further east and look at art that combines Islamic elements with artistic traditions borrowed from other cultures, Persia and India.